we're going to get started uh, with our deans uh, introducing themselves, starting from the far end. Good morning. Um, my name is Joel Maurer, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions at the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State University. Um, uh, we are a community-based uh, medical school, uh, which means that you would do the first your your first two years, your preclinical years, in one of two different preclinical campuses, and then your third and fourth years of medical school, you're based in one of seven different. Uh, clinical campuses all across the state. Good morning. My name is uh, Ted Hall. I'm uh, Assistant Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions at the David Geffen School of Medicine. I'm also a professor of pediatric radiology and uh, chair of the third year clerkship in radiology there. Um, I represent actually three schools in one, uh, the David Geffen School of Medicine, uh, the UC Riverside School uh, and the uh, Charles R. Drew School of Medicine, all of which are enrolled under the UCLA School of Medicine banner. Uh, we are a uh, campus that's spread out around the Los Angeles area, and one of the fun facts I think about being in LA is that you can ski and water ski and um, uh, snow ski in the same day. All right. Good morning. My name is Ugo Ezenkwal. I'm uh, one of the faculty members over at New York University School of Medicine. I'm on the Executive Committee, the Admissions Committee, and the New York University School of Medicine has been around for quite a while, since 1851. We're probably one of the only medical schools who are in a big city, a big metropolis. We take care of a lot of patients, and you'll have a lot of access to some of the best patients out there. We have Bellevue Hospital Center, which is the nation's oldest public hospital. And we actually located maybe, a fun fact is, a few blocks away from the United Nations. So when the president is in town, you'll be directly responsible for taking care of the president. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Danny Taraguchi. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, I also work across as a faculty member to incorporate cultural competency across our new curriculum. And kind of an interesting fact about Johns Hopkins, we started something called the Access Partnership. It allows the entire two zip codes around the East Baltimore community of Johns Hopkins to come in to have full access to primary care and specialty care that are underinsured or have no insurance for a very low cost. It's been a difficult uh, relationship with the surrounding community. It's a way to give access and prevent health care disparities, which is a big focus of our, our curriculum there. Good morning. My name is Cindy Morris. I'm the uh, Dean for Admissions at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. We are a freestanding university that has a medical school and a dental school and a school of nursing. We are not part of University of Oregon, despite the fact we'd like to have the revenue from their football team this year. Um, we uh, uh, draw upon the community. We have a very strong rural population in the state of Oregon and therefore are trying to train primary care physicians. We're the only, and I can say this, the only campus, medical school campus in the country that has a tram that runs from the upper campus to the lower campus about a five minute ride. <laughs> Hello, my name is Adrian Jones. I'm the Dean of Admissions and Recruitment at Loyola Strict School of Medicine in Chicago. Uh, Loyola University Chicago is just west of the downtown Chicago area. Uh, we are one of the few Jesuit schools in the country that has a full functioning health system, which includes the medical, medical school uh, surrounded by a full medical campus, which includes 28 different facilities that our students matriculate in and out of the Chicago area. Uh, we have one of the nicest health gyms you'll ever be a member of if you go to a medical school. So <laughs> that's one of the fun facts that I like to put out there. Good morning, everybody. My name is David Neumeyer. I'm the Dean of Admissions at Tufts University School of Medicine. Tufts is in Boston. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out here today and also for the people who organized this meeting for inviting me. Uh, Tufts is uh, actually in downtown Boston, about 15 minutes uh, from the main university campus. The medical campus is, is uh, smack in the middle of Boston. Uh, most people know about Boston. We're the home of the uh, the Red Sox and uh, other great sports teams, but Boston is a, a great city to, uh, to practice, to live, and to be a student. Uh, we're a medium to large size medical school. We have uh, our main campus uh, in Boston, but we have an auxiliary campus up in southern Maine in Portland. 
and uh, our students rotate through about 16 different teaching hospitals. Um, a fun fact about Tufts uh, is that we are the home school for Tracy Chapman, and we're also the home school for uh, a relatively new band you may have heard of called Guster. Guster. <laughs> no, I <don't> <laughs> you, you will hear of Guster. <laughs> My name is Richard Wallace, and I'm the Associate Director of Admissions at the Duke Medical School. Um, one of the things that differs from me from the other people that are on this panel, the other distinguished folks that are on this panel, this one and the one previously, is I'm probably the only one that's not an MD. You're not an MD. I'm a JD. You're a JD. Well, I ain't even a JD. <laughs> <laughs> Do not misunderstand my power. <laughs> the letters come from my office nonetheless. Amen. Fun fact about Duke, hmm, basketball, let me think. Duke helps me pay my mortgage, but I didn't vote for Duke in the basketball tourney. I went to Syracuse. And I watched Syracuse get beat by Butler. And then I watched Duke beat Butler. Guess who I was rooting for? <laughs> but anyway, that's it. <laughs> All right, I want to thank our deans one more time with one more uh, round of applause before we start. <laughs> and then we'll begin with our first question to Dr. Marr. And it's, uh, how much do you favor in-state applicants versus out-of-state applicants at your school? Well, being that Michigan State is a state-supported medical school by the state of Michigan, clearly we do place um, an emphasis on recruiting students uh, who are residents of the state of Michigan. Now, having said that, um, we have a long history of accepting approximately 20% of our of each incoming class from uh, states other than um, Michigan. Uh, this last year, our admissions uh, uh, matriculating co uh, class had, um, I believe it was 42 out-of-state students, of which 19 were from California. Um, we have a long history of educating um, uh, highly qualified candidates and, and young doctors to be from the state of California. Um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon, so. Excellent, all right, next is for uh, Dr. Clifton. Do medical school admissions committees accept uh, updated information that the students send in during the rolling admissions period? Oh, for, for Clifton? She's not here. <laughs> oh, I didn't even Sorry. Um, all right, have her, uh, Dr. Neumeyer. <laughs> I get this one by proxy. Uh, so we, uh, we do absolutely accept updated information throughout the year. We get it very commonly, and that might include an updated MCAT score. It might be um, a paper that you published. It might be... Um, email just to, to tell us what you're up to. Um, there are all sorts of things and, and we're very open to that kind of information. Uh, it's pretty commonplace. Okay, um, that brings us also around for, for publishing papers um, about how much professional achievements uh, in the workforce or are outside of the academic um, world, how much emphasis schools put on that or how much weight they'll, they'll understand that a, a student um, outside of school was heavily involved in research or in their, their job in the business world. So um, if Dr. Wallace would like to take that. I think that you have to take into consideration if you're applying to the MD-PhD program, it is almost expected that you will have published. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a first author, but if you are an author on a paper, it certainly um, is, is it makes for an attractive application. In terms of students who do research, and, and it's probably good to focus on research, particularly if you are applying to the so-called research intensive institutions. 
most of the medical schools nowadays are involved in research and are research intensive. And a lot of you may ask, why do medical schools want me to have research experience? And the answer to that question is, research enables you to solve problems. It encourages you to think critically. Most medical schools nowadays will say to you, you need to have research experience in order to be looked at seriously. Duke will not discount your application if you do not have research experience. But let's say that 97% of the students that have come into the last two classes have had some form of research experience. And I'll just add something quickly in terms of the curriculum. Duke's curriculum is very different. We always have to do things different from everybody else. At Duke, your first year is your basic science year. In other words, you sit in the classroom for one year. In your second year, when your colleagues are still in the classroom, you start your clerkships. So the first year at Duke is very intense, it's very focused, it's very fast-paced, and it's very long. In the third year, which we call the scholarly year, is an opportunity for you to go out into the world and do something. Go learn something. And the opportunities and the options for that experience, experience are limited only to your imagination. So you can pretty much do anything you want to do with the third year, which sounds pretty unbelievable, but the fact is it's true. And then the fourth year is pretty much as in most medical schools where you have your sub eyes, your electives, and you actually prepare for residency to start the process all over again. So, I don't know if I answered the question, but it's, if, you, if you publish, great. If you do not, don't worry about it. All right, and to continue up on the other side of that question, uh, Dr. Taraguchi, if you could answer for students um, who spent maybe many years uh, in the business world, something with a, a career that's completely unrelated to applying to medical school and being a doctor, um, do, you, do you talk to them about um, their accomplishments there? Do they impact how you see uh, their, their application, their strengths? So that's a great question. I think there are a lot of uh, different students who decide where medicine fits in their life at different stages, whether they've done a BA, they've been out in the business world, done other degrees. And I think how it factors into the application process, we really want to know and understand your story of why you decided to make this pro uh, profession. And it, it doesn't matter so much about what you did in the business world, but we want to know how that experience either translated and formed and, and look at the way that you want to see medicine and how it impacts your life. Because you want to get into medicine because you love it, you want to make a difference in people's life, you want to serve it. So I think part of it is really looking at what you're going to contribute to, to the community in that, that stage. And it, and it varies at different levels. We have a, a gentleman that um, is graduating in his fourth year, worked at Amazon.com for many years as a computer technician, has an MBA, did research with um, Amazon. And, and he assures me, every time you click on Amazon, you're, you're completing some sort of data for them to do some consumer uh, report. And he mentions that how we want to have impact with people in a different capacity, and that he felt like medicine was the place to do it. In the business world, he thought initially was going to be that. So I think as you, as you look at the breadth, uh, admissions kiddies really want to understand what your passion is about medicine. It is a very long and exciting journey. And if you get halfway through it, we really want to understand how are you going to deal with that excitement. Um, um, like my colleague had said at Duke, there's a very long years of basic science. You, you have to have a passion and a drive to be able to do this. If business and understanding that you lessons that you learned is a big part of it. And I think there's a timeline of maturity that students go through. And it's very important for admissions committee to understand your maturity at that level as you begin to make these very critical decisions along your life. Sometimes the business world helps you understand it from a different perspective. As an admissions committee, we want to understand how that helps you uh, with your peers that you're going to be exchanging and, and working on a team to help them see the world from a different place. So we really try to look at the breadth of the experiences. But those notions of maturity, your passion, and the journey that we, we want to really understand why you're driving and, and that motivation to be a, a physician. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Morris, uh, at your school, do you um, have any programs in place at, at the medical student level to encourage them to go into primary care afterwards or any other specialty? Uh, <clears throat> yes, we, OHSU or Oregon is known as a primary care school. Um, it is one of our emphasis. So 
starting in the very first year, starting probably in your second week of medical school, we place you into a clinical situation for a half a day a week in the community. And for the first two years, in fact, you get an extensive amount of experience through this um, uh, preceptorship with a physician. Some of that is with a primary care physician, some of that is with a specialist, so that you get some understanding of the difference of both practices. There's also a rural clinical um, clerkship in which you, are, you go out to a rural place in Oregon, and believe me, Oregon does have some relatively rural, in fact, some would call it frontier practices <laughs> in, which the, in which students will spend um, five to six weeks in that setting, live in the community, get to know the people in that community, do a community service project, and at the same time, get to understand what the practice of medical care is. And that's a primary care practice in those communities. So I think by the end of your medical school, in fact, by the end of your third year, you really do understand what primary care is all about. And in fact, we hope in, a, in somewhere around 50% or more of our graduates is our benchmark for their commitment to primary care. Okay. Um, Dr. Jones, if you would like to add anything about any programs at your school that encourage students into one field, whether it be primary care or anything else? So as a Catholic Jesuit medical institution, uh, the focus that we look at medicine is a way to serve. And so we've, we have incorporated uh, a number of different programs for our students to get involved in the community. Uh, we have programs that deal with international medical missions trips, um, which is something that a lot of students are attracted to during the, after your first year. Uh, but also during the uh, time that students are there, they're very involved in what I call our urban immersion program because there's a lot of people in our own communities who are suffering. So we have a lot of community health, community clinics. Uh, during Thanksgiving, our atrium is full of food, which we give to local, uh, uh, local communities. A lot of our students do a lot of work with uh, homeless shelters and things like that. So the goal and the purpose really is to use the medicine as a way to serve. And we find that probably anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of our graduates at some level end up going into some sort of primary care. Okay, excellent. Um, next, going on more with the service side of things in the undergraduate career. I know we, we know that uh, having some experience in clinical, having some experience in research, depending on what your university you're going to, but service is always kind of there in the background as um, something you should always be doing throughout your undergraduate career. Um, just to get some ideas of how much weight you guys uh, still continue to put on that, if any, or if it, it falls short of clinical and research. So um, if we want to have Dr. Wallace uh, say something about that. Without community service, without some evidence that you have interacted with people who are different than you are. Don't look to me. I'm not interested. And I'll tell you why. And I bring this with me every year, and it, and it's, it, it sums up, I believe, in a great sense, why you're here. And it's a quote by Dr. King. And it's one that I have over my desk. I tell people, or ask people, Take it home with you. Put it on your refrigerator. Look at it every day. An individual has not started living fully until they can rise above the narrow confines of individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. Every person must decide at some point whether they will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. This is the judgment. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And that's where the community service comes in. You can't begin to understand how important what you're doing, a commitment to human service in your medical education and beyond, if you don't start somewhere. And the expectation is that we will have started as an undergraduate, getting out into the community helping other people, doing for others. Without it, no one's going to look at you. I don't think so. Dr. Ozenquell, do you have anything to add? Sure. I, uh, 
I think uh, just to reiterate a lot of the things that have been said here, service is key and fundamental to what you want to aspire to as a physician. Uh, it's important for you to realize that when you're taking care of patients, you are actually in the business of medicine. You are actually fundamentally helping and assisting people. And it's important for you to realize during your four years of, of undergraduate that service is key and integral to this quest to become a physician. This service does not end with you getting acceptance into medical school. It continues on in medical school. And guess what? It continues on even beyond that. So yes, it's critical and fundamental for you to realize that it is important. I think service is key. At New York University School of Medicine, we definitely, definitely look for service. And service can be, there's a myriad ways to, to, to serve. Um, you can work out in a soup kitchen. You can build and work in a free clinic. We have a New York City free clinic, which is a student run, medical students run and students volunteer. And it's the one of its kind in the whole city. And it really serves the uninsured and in the community. This is the kind of service that we look for and we aspire. And this organization was set up by, guess what? An undergraduate who came in and set up as a medical student. So we looked at these activities on your behalf, and I think it's important for you to realize that in order to be a seasoned and qualified human service person, you have to actually articulate it and show it in your actions and what you do. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, the next question is going to be focusing a little bit more on uh, students that may have come, uh, gotten their undergraduate education or uh, their high school education outside of the country. And once meeting the requirements uh, required to apply to your school, how, how can you look and kind of compare um, for, for students that have gotten most of their education outside of the United States education system? Does that, um, do you have a sort of, sort of system of trying to equate it on some level, or do you mainly look for the personal statement for explanations? And then uh, Dr. Wallace? There are some standards that are, that are articulated and clearly defined by the two agencies that govern medical education in this country. And one is the AAMC and the other one is the LCME, which is the Liaison Committee on Medical Education. And those are the folks who say to Duke and all of these medical schools, you can confer medical degrees. And they have some, some basic requirements. And the requirements are really, you know, you can ask whether or not they're fair. And, and I have asked myself that question for the last nine years because there's an assumption that education in the United States is superior to that in other countries of the world. My, mm, Madame Curie was French. <laughs> mm. So what we have to do is we have to, as admissions committees and as medical schools, be somewhat subservient to the parameters that are mandated by the folks who say that we can do what we do legally. And at Duke, we will certainly consider an applicant who has earned their undergraduate degree from outside of the United States as long as they have it studied at least one year and generally, when we're talking one year, we're talking two academic semesters of coursework. And I prefer to see science coursework in the United States. Um, in terms of the evaluation process itself, the same expectations. For those students who are international students and are studying here in the United States, completing or have completed an undergraduate degree here in the US, there are no additional requirements. You are evaluated in the same way as U.S. domestic students or students who are residents or lawful permanent residents. All right, then uh, I think we'll uh, start with Dr. Morris again for this next question. Uh, we asked at last panel, and it inspired a little bit of debate about um, this new trend towards switching over to the multiple mini interview, uh, interview process. So uh, have you considered switching over your own school, and uh, do you have any comments on it? We very much have. Um, for those of you who may be applying to OHSU this year, you're in luck if you want to look at it that way. But next year, we will be doing the multiple medical interview, in fact, or mini interview. And in fact, one of the reasons I came down here today to Sacramento, other than getting to speak to all of you, is to go to UC Davis to see, to see that in action and to talk to their um, staff to understand how it's working. We very carefully considered this 
And even though we know we will be on the sort of bleeding edge here, uh, we do plan to adopt this for next year. Excellent. And then um, any other uh, sure. of our deans thinking of switching over? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I could just um, add something to that. We, we actually right now at New York University School of Medicine, we, just, we don't have the multiple interview, but we actually do get comments, and I just want to be clear on the interview process. You have a formal interview with someone who's a member of the faculty that goes through the process. But there's actually many interviews that take place already, if you hadn't um, noticed this. And this may go with the students who are scorching your tour, and this may go with the uh, admissions department clerks or the staff, and this may actually go with the faculty as well. So it's, it's, it's key for you to understand that this is already taking place, and there may be a form, and some institutions are formalizing it now. But when I open the package to finally review you, as a student, I am getting comments from a lot of different sources, and it's not just a formal interviewer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say that um, this year is going to be our pilot, uh, not our pilot year, but our inaugural year for doing the multi-mini interview process at the David Geffen School of Medicine. We've actually had experience with it in our smaller program, the Prime program, which is a five-year program for our students who are interested in becoming leaders in underserved communities. Most of those students, in fact, all of those students in the last three years of the interview process have gone through a multi-mini interview process using 12 stations for their uh, uh, interview process. One of those stations actually was a writing station and another one of them was a drawing station. We are now going to do that this year for the first time for the entire Dave, uh, David Geffen School of Medicine class that has applied. We will be starting in November of this year, well, actually late October this year with our interview process. It'll be seven stations for those students to go through and it'll be a, a half day process where we'll have actually the multi mini interview uh, in addition to uh, tours by our second year students a presentation by our senior associate dean of the medical school and a, um, a presentation by our senior associate dean of the uh, uh, medical education department on the curriculum of the school. So we're putting together an entire day, half day package for the students to participate in. I wish I knew how to do that logistically. <laughs> it must be an undertaking. One of the things that we did at Duke three years ago, and, and for those of you who are embracing in technology, which is probably everyone in this room, we had more people to interview three years ago than we had the interview slots for on campus. And we used to have our uh, regional alums, folks spread out all over the country who would help us with this. But what happened when you try to have third parties involved in the process, you lose control of it, and that's what happened with us. So we were sitting around a table saying, well, we've got 500 more people to interview than we have slots for on campus. What are we gonna do? And I raised my little non-MD hand, and I said, well, I have friends in Europe, and I have some friends in South America, and I use Skype. And the, some of the faculty around the table were kind of rolling their eyes going, well, first of all, some of them didn't know what Skype was. And I said, well, do you not watch Oprah? Or, you know, don't you watch Who, who Wants to Be a Millionaire? But um, make a long story short, fast forward, that is now one of our options. So the option is to interview on campus and to do what we call the virtual interview. The difference between the two is obviously if you come to campus, you get to interact with folks and students and you get to tour and all of that good stuff that happens on the interview day. But with the virtual interview, you get to spend as much time with me or whoever the faculty person is that's interviewing you as possible. I interviewed a young man two weeks ago who's going to be leaving service in, a, in Afghanistan. He's been deployed for four years. He is a special forces combat medic. I spent three hours with him. No interview on campus or in any other format is going to give me an opportunity to get to know this guy like I did. I want this man at medical school. I want him at Duke, and I would trust him with my life. So we're going to have all different kinds of experiences, as many different kinds of institutions and as many different kinds of interview experiences, but remember, and I'm doing the interview thing this afternoon, that the interview is an opportunity for you to tell us what's inside your head 
within reason, we have no right to get inside your head, but also what's inside your heart and why this career choice means so much to you. Well, it's an excellent point for uh, all the different opportunities now that uh, medical schools are providing to get to know the applicants better with more and more people applying, I think, to each school. I think that's why there's such a trend now with trying to try out different ways to really get to know um, in an as efficient way as possible, but really as an in-depth way as possible, all of the applicants at your schools. So that's a, a very excellent uh, example, Dr. Wallace. Um, I think we're going to go back a little bit uh, to the service questions and uh, start with Dr. Marr. Are there any types of service that students have put down, listed on their applications, that don't really count as service, that uh, students can't try to get away with? Uh, anything you've noticed as a, a, a trend that causes you to raise an eyebrow? Um, yeah, I think as someone who's also sat on the admissions committee as well for the last five years, one of the things that um, we have some difficulties in trying to determine is this community service versus not. Um, and and, it, and it, this really isn't an issue, I think, of being dishonest. I think it's an issue of, of us trying to figure out is this really a service or is there something else going on? And, and it's the issue of tutoring and tutoring amongst um, for your fellow classmates, because most of the time um, that area on the AMCAS um, application does, doesn't necessarily give you a good opportunity to express whether or not is that a paid position, is that, um, a, uh, is that a program that uh, through your department you're identified as someone who has excelled in that area and we would, you know, would appreciate your input. Um, so that, you know, is an area I think a little bit of some confusion for some some of our committee members is how do we how do we apply that to the idea of community service? Um, I mean, as far as frank dishonesty, um, I, I'm not. I, I guess I might have to defer to some of the other members on the on the on the panel because I don't think I've seen. Uh, in my, at least in the five years that I've been affiliated with our uh, admissions process, something that has been brought up to our admissions committee um, from a viable candidate that we really question the honesty behind it. So, so last year I read probably 6,300 medical school applications. Uh, this year I've read probably close to 2,500 applications and probably another 4,000 left in front of me. And so one of the things that, is, at, that we look for and I look really hard at is how much have you done to help someone else? And so when I look at a service opportunity, I know when someone has had a valuable experience because they write differently. They express it differently. The value of the experience is much more defined when you have something that has been very impactful instead of something that's dishonest. And it's hard for me to tell honesty versus dishonesty. It's just too difficult to look at. But I do know when I can see someone who has done something that has impacted their lives and have impacted the lives of other people. Um, I'm looking for a level of humility, a level of understanding, a level of respect, um, and something that has transcended that experience to kind of move them and shape them into a world of why they possibly want to end up going into this, wor this world of medicine. And so if you're looking at an experience, especially a service experience, don't do it because I want to read it. Do it because it's valuable for you. And I can tell. And I think most of the po folks on this committee can tell when we read an application that seems somewhat superficial. Um, regarding how well that experience is. I mean, I have some students who just sometimes put things down because everybody has to check off the box of what you guys think we want to see. But what we're trying to see is what's unique about who you are, what's the value of it, and how will it impact your future as a physician. I think those are more important than honesty and dishonesty because it's too difficult to tell in a short period of time. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Taraguchi. Uh, have you ever encountered any instances where there's been some um, discontinuity between the personal statement and the, the faculty letter of recommendation? Something where you, where you got some sense from reading from a personal statement that they were really involved in service or in research or in clinical, and then in all the letters turned in, uh, they're not you know, from those areas or they don't mention that at all. What do you usually do to try and figure out um, where, where the problem is? or? if they just really are over-involved? Or, or do you see those type of applications too much? Do you recommend that people stick to one topic 
or um, what's your response? Great, so thanks. Uh, so it's, what I usually tell students is a part of an application is telling a story, like many of my panelists are, are giving you ways of what the reader wants to know about you. And oftentimes with faculty letters, it's very strategic how you want to tell a story um, and choose your fac faculty in, in a way that represents and complements your application. So for example, if you are, um, say you are concerned about your intellectual capacity to be, do well at medical school, say you had a rough first year, um, then you matured over time. And if you choose a faculty recommendation letter that only knows you um, from the senior level or that first year, it's not going to match your full story. So if, if you see areas that you feel like are going to be weak, you want to make sure a faculty member of the recommendation letter can talk about over longitudinally of your experience that why they struggle in the first year, which is very common for many undergraduates, they matured over time, and these are the things that had an experience that, that prepared them for the medical school, that when they get in trouble in medical school, they are going to ask for help. They know how to climb this up out of the hole. So there's been a lot of discontinuity sometimes between how students want to represent their faculty and how they do a personal statement. What I try to advise students is that you need to see your whole package. And packing is a very important part of medical school, how you strategically choose certain kinds of faculty. And oftentimes I draw a little chart of a line that goes up and down. These are the places that you've been successful. You want to make sure that faculty can talk about those. But you also want to have a well-rounded one so that they do match. There is some discontinuity. And what I usually tell students is you don't want to leave it up to the missions committee to figure out what's unique why you want to be in medical school, what are things that inform your life that really want you to pursue medicine. You have to design the packages. And I will say some, some, some students do a much better job putting that together strategically, and there is some dis discontinuity. You don't want to leave the gaps for students, and it does leave it up to chance if somebody's going to help fill in the blanks. You leave it up to a much more interpretation uh, for the committee to decide, are you a good candidate for this school? And my advice to you is, is you know, talk to your faculty members, uh, work through your personal statement, show, share it with as many people as you can to create a, a story that you want to tell a medical school. This is why you want to be there. This is what you've uh, experienced as you've been formed with. This is why you can be successful in medical school. And if there is this continuity, you should tease it out at that period. Once it gets to the middle application stage, it's really difficult to, to, to tease out. And, and we've seen the areas where the personal statement is not um, connected to what the faculty is say, but then the admissions committee will decide what does this mean, and depending on what else is said in the application, they'll interpret like this is a really good um, range, a spectrum of the students that have experience. Yet, you know, what does that mean in terms of how they prepared and had foresight of what we expect in a medical school? Because a lot of part of being in medical school is anticipating how people think, how people um, want to, to be part of the medical world. And I'll, oftentimes when I do the exhibit booths, I'll ask students, what do you expect the medical school to want in an applicant? And it's, I'm always surprised that it's very difficult for pre-med uh, pre students to think about what they want. They always say intellectual capacity. And I'll give you a quick example about this notion of service. I had a student ask me, he's uh, the oldest of six children in a single family home. He asked, should that be in the application? And like many of my colleagues said here, I say relevance. You need to help the missions committee understand the relevance of that. Does that show leadership? Does that show maturity? Does that show um, uh, a decision-making process? How does it help you be a better physician? And I think that's how you have to package your, your application, not in fragmented segments, but tell a whole picture of what makes you a good physician and a, and a larger picture. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Neumeyer, have you found... Um, do you, you prefer students in their application express a direct interest in a field um, where they might go on to specialize, whether it be something like uh, primary care or already in uh, cardiology or neurology? Do you uh, prefer that they already have thought that out and have a, or do you prefer that they remain open and they, they haven't figured it out? Or? So, so the question being whether you need to know what you want to do before you apply to medical school, and I would say absolutely not. <clears throat> um, we consider it our charge, in a sense, to teach you medicine. And if you do have interest in a particular subspecialty or specialty of medicine, that's absolutely fine. You may find out later on in life um, that you want to change your mind. But we really have no pretense about um, who our students are in terms of what they want to go into later on in their career. And, and as much as we really do value people going into primary care, and we certainly emphasize it at Tufts, uh, we, we do not have any sort of expectation that students will go into primary care. Uh, we have a separate track, uh, which is called the main track, 
um, I alluded to a little bit earlier. And that track has a special charge because Maine is an underserved, a medically underserved part of the country. And so our goal with that track is to get people to work in the state of Maine. However, they're not just short on primary care doctors, they're also short on urologists and cardiothoracic surgeons and radiologists, the whole spectrum of uh, medical subspecialties. So we, we really um, take it onto ourselves to enlighten you in the field of medicine, not to just train you in a particular area. That's something you get later on in your, in your training. Okay, this will probably be our last question. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Hall, and it talks about the ethics in uh, medical school interviews. Uh, what type of questions you ask that uh, maybe don't stray or aren't focused so much on the application and, you know, how, how did you meet the professor that you did your research with, but that really try to get to the core of the individual. Uh, do you practice those kind of questions and then uh, what should students expect? Well, this year we are actually, as I mentioned earlier, going to the multi-mini interviews. So there will be seven uh, questions that the students will have to all answer, so everyone will have a uniform um, exam, uh, interview process that way. Our, I should mention that that is not the only thing that we use in our decision-making process. Actually, we actually will use the cognitive as well as the non-cognitive data that we get from the AMCAS application and the secondary application that our students will fill out. But we have, the, we have divided the multi-minute in the pro process into several domains that we are going to be looking into. And the domains that we're looking at are um, uh, intellectual curiosity, um, uh, the student's ability to uh, communicate well, um, honesty and integrity is a, dish, is a, is a domain that we'll be looking at. Uh, one of the other donates is cultural awareness that we will be looking at, um, ability to work with team, uh, with other members of a team as a, a medical uh, person because you'll have to work with different types of uh, team members and healthcare policy is also going to be one of our domains that we're going to have questions in. So each of those different domains will be evaluated differently. We're looking to sort of pick out the attributes which we think will, one, make someone successful in medical school. Hopefully, we'll help, be able to identify some of those. And then, two, what we think will help them be a successful physician in their career later on, whatever it is that they choose to, be, um, to go into. So Dr. Jones, do you have anything to add to, uh, for the interview process for how to, to get at the ethics of the individual? Um, yeah, we have uh, one of the things that we adopted when I first came was a list of questions dealing specifically. We have a bioethics institute at Loyola, and a lot of students have an opportunity to uh, go further in the pursuit of bioethics from either an honors or and or a master's in the program. So one of the things that we focus a lot on um, through our interview process is dealing with an ethical issue and how do you, when we have a litany of questions, too many probably to go through right now, but it is a focal point of our interview process. I also just wanted to make a comment real quick, just to step back to talk about the personal statement. Um, we have a very ex extensive supplemental application at Loyola. And the other day I asked a folk, I was doing a presentation, and I asked a, a gentleman, I said, how many people looked at your personal statement? And everybody around the room said three, four, five people. I said, how many people looked at your supplemental application? And they looked at me like, well, what are you talking about? And sometimes they were pre pretty much the only author on their supplemental application. That's pretty much where I get a sense. The first thing I actually look at when I open up an application is the supplemental application. In that supplemental application, I really get a sense of who a person is, what they're, what, who they're about, what their altruism is. And so when people look at our supplemental, it scares them off because they actually have to do a little bit of work, which, again, you want to go to medical school, surprises me. But again, a part of this process for us is what are you really trying to say? And so when you're talking about a disconnect between the application and the person, that's where I typically find a lot of information. If a school gives you an opportunity to do a supplemental and gives you a narrative, spend some time with it. Because I, trust me, we look at them, and a lot of us spend a lot of time with those particular things. So I just wanted to kind of make that comment before I move forward. We, we actually have, um, we have two interviews at Tufts. The first one is um, either with a faculty member, and the second one is uh, possibly with a fourth year student. And our fourth year students are full voting members of our admissions committee. And um, I train our committee members to keep the interviews conversational. We, we're basically just trying to get to know you as people. And, and the reason is that if you're invited to interview with us, we, we find through our review 
from um, of your application that that you're qualified at least on paper that we think you're you're smart you're successful you've done a lot of service you've done all the things that we think you should have done to satisfy the preliminary requirements of, of coming to our medical school but the interview is really to make sure that you're a people person and that's required and that's why every single medical school across the country requires interviews because it's not just a profession of intellect it's also a profession where you need to have people skills. So I think we all probably agree here on the panel that that is a core component of the interviews is to make sure that that uh, you're a nice person. Yeah, could I just add, add one other thing? Uh, I think those are extremely wise words. I, I just want you to understand that the hardest part about medical school is actually getting into medical school. And unfortunately, some institutions, some undergraduate institutions do a better job of presenting their students than others. So it is actually up to you, this student, to take the onus up and find out what it is about your package that may or may not be lacking. And that requires an investigation, talking to the other students, your undergraduates who've been through this, talking to medical students who you may know, befriending them, finding out what it is about. You should have at least 11 people review your personal statements and people who are not even in medicine, lay people who can read your personal statement and make sense of it. You should have several other people look at your supplemental statements. Mm -hmm. It's very important that you get a well-rounded idea of the activities that you're doing that other people can weigh in on it because some institutions, unfortunately, they don't have the glitz and the gloss to put you a, a nice package together for you, but you can actually counteract that if you do some due diligence on your part. Mm -hmm. I think it's important, it's critical. The most, of the, 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 the most of you here on a Saturday early morning shows that you're motivated and you're talented enough to really want to do this. So I think that at least the people in this auditorium have the capacity to put together a really well thought out and articulated package out there. Okay, thank you so much. I think that wraps it up. If we could give a round of applause.